guys hear me in the back? Is the mic on? All right, sweet. So today we're going to wrap up generics, and then if we have a little extra time, which we might, um, I will just sort of take any questions about the midterm you might have or any and sort of other end of semester stuff. All right, so we'll do some review, because I think this is something that's worth seeing again, right? Um, this is, you know, Java generics is something that brings in some new syntax and really fundamentally brings in a new idea about how to write computer programs, right? Again, this idea of being able to write a class that works on a wide variety of other classes, but still allows us to provide the type safety that we want as part of the Java language, right? Again, this is something, this is an idea that you see again in other ways, in other languages. Not always the same, sometimes a little bit different, uh, but when you guys get to 225 and start looking at templates, um, you're gonna see something that looks pretty familiar. Okay, so one of the places we see generics in Java is when we work with Java's built-in container classes. So Java has, you know, we've talked about how to implement lists and maps, but Java has its own built-in uh, versions of these containers, and that's what you should use when you're, normally when you're writing code. Um, so we've looked at both lists and maps, lists which essentially function as a generalization of an array, allow me to put items in order, and maps which it kind of extend arrays with this idea of now the keys in my array, rather than just being integers and having to be contiguous, those keys can be anything. So now I can essentially establish a mapping between a key and a value, where the key and the value can be arbitrary Java objects. Okay. But we, what we saw was the problem with these is that if we use them without utilizing Java's generic system, which you can do because Java's generic system was introduced in a later version of Java, so if I do things like this, essentially what happens is when I inserted that string literal into the list on line 10, Java automatically upcast it to an object reference. So anything that comes out of that list is also an object reference. And so on line 12, this is sort of a good review of some of the things you guys might see on the final midterm. On line 12, I have a problem, because list.get's gonna return me an object reference, and I'm trying to downcast it to a string, and I won't, I can't do that in Java, right, without an explicit downcast. Java's gonna force me to put an explicit downcast in there. But then I have the problem that if the thing that comes out of the list, if the thing that was at the end, or the beginning of the list at that point isn't a string, now I'm gonna have a class cast exception at runtime, which is terrible, okay? So, you know, and again, early on in the days of Java, this is what you did, and you just dealt with it, right? You handled it, right? You had to write code very carefully in order to make sure that, you know, everything you put into a list was a particular type so that you could work with those things, right? Oh, hello. It's so, oh, that, that was actually kind of cool. Did you see that? It was like why it was striped across the whole, I should have left it there. It's a good metaphor for life. Um, all right, so, so, you know, and, and one of the things we talked about, and this is, this is true, right, of, and this is something to think about whenever you write computer code, right, is the more checks of any kind you can do while you're developing, whether that's compile, that the compiler helping you check things, whether it's a tool like check style that looks for formatting problems. A lot of other languages have this idea of linting, which is a tool that can look for potential problems for you. Any of that you can do in development is great because it'll help you catch problems. And those problems that you catch during development, that you catch before you ship your code, don't manifest themselves as crashes or failures that affect real users or embarrass you in front of, you know, potential investors or whatever, right? So anything you can do during development, right, whether that means using a compiler, a linter, a formatting checker, you know, there's a bunch of these tools. Every language has its own ecosystem of these tools. Right? Um, anything you can do before you ship the code is, is better, right? Because it doesn't break in front of someone you care about. So that was the impetus behind Java's generic system. So essentially, Java said, look, is there a way to design a feature of the language so that we can still get the generality of these containers? It's really nice that I only have to implement a list once, and then it works for any Java object. It's nice that I only have to implement one hash, one implement of a map, one implementation of a map that might use hashing, for example, and then I can put any Java object in as a key and a value. But is there a way to do this 
and yet still allow the compiler to help when I'm writing the code, because the compiler now needs to know what are you planning on doing with this list? So this is, uh, this is where Java's generic system comes from. This is how we provide information for the compiler to tell it what we're going to do with these generic data structures, okay? So now on line six, what I'm telling the compiler is, I'm creating a list that I'm gonna use to store integers. If I put something in that's not an integer, tell me about it. Down there on line seven, I'm saying, I'm creating a map that's gonna, that's gonna store mappings from integers to strings. If I put on, try to put a mapping from a string to an integer, please complain. So this information, is, so I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this information, even if it's provided in kind of a gnarly way with these angle brackets or whatever, this is critical information for the compiler to know, because otherwise, it has no idea what I'm trying to do with this list, or what type of mappings I intend this map to store, okay? Over here on the right side, we have this thing, what's called the diamond operator. Essentially, it's a shorthand for copying the same type parameters from the left side, where I'm declaring my variable, to the right side, where I'm initializing the implementation that that reference variable is going to store a reference to. Okay. So essentially, Java generics, by providing this extra information, I get these two really desirable features, right? I get, because, you know, remember, every Java object can be upcast to object capital O object. And so I can still build a map that stores mappings between any types of Java objects. So it's very easy in Java to build general purpose data structures and all of Java's container classes that are built in, lists, sets, maps, trees, whatever, they all work on any object in Java. Because all objects have an equals and they have a hash code and that's pretty much all you need to build most of these containers. But I still get the type checking. So these type parameters that I add when I declare generic, um, generic variables and, and, you know, and is a way of telling the compiler information about what I'm going to do so the compiler can then help and make sure that I'm doing things properly, okay? So again, so now what I'm doing here is I'm saying I'm gonna use this list for strings. If I try to put an integer in on line 14, this generates a compiler error, right? Not a runtime error. Same thing on line 22. Now if I try to put in a mapping from integer to integer into a map that I've declared is gonna store a mapping from strings to integers, the compiler is gonna complain. The other nice thing that happens here is because the compiler knows what type of reference is gonna be stored, it can do the downcast for me automatically. So if you'll notice, what I get out of my list on line 12 is a string reference. I don't have to do this unsafe downcast. Same thing on line 20, what I get out of the map is an integer because I declared that the map values would be integers. Okay. And you'll see this, you know, again, I just wanna point this out in Java documentation, because this could be something that, that might have scared you a little bit if you looked at this earlier in the semester. You see these, like, what is going on here? But now you know enough to understand what this is. This is a generic interface. In Java, I can have classes that are generic, and I can also have interfaces that are generic. So this is a generic map interface from key to value. Okay, so, this means that when I'm declaring an instance of a reference variable, it's gonna store a reference to something that implements this interface. I can provide the key and the value so that Java can do the type checking for me, okay? All right, so last time what we did, you know, fairly quickly, is we looked at how to use type parameters as part of our own classes. So a lot of times when you're working with Java, you're going to implement, you're gonna be working with Java's built-in lists and maps, and you'll just use the generic notation, otherwise you're gonna get all these compiler warnings that you probably wanna make go away. But what about if I actually want to utilize Java's generic system as part of my own class? I have a class that I can create that is general, and I want to be able to have it run on a lot of Java, ob different types of Java objects, but I also want this type safety. And so we looked at a way to create classes that accept type parameters. So this class called simple link list takes, is now declared to accept a single type parameter E. And I can use that parameter in the body of my class anywhere that I would normally see a type, okay? So get, when I declare a function, the function I have to declare what the return type of the function is, okay? Here, instead of saying void or int or string, I say e, e is a type parameter. So whatever parameter was used to parameterize the class is now the return type of get. I can also use it on parameters to functions, right? So Whatever parameter was used to parameterize the class 
is now the type of the value argument that's passed as the second argument to set. One thing to, to note about this is that parameters are not variables, okay? So I can't use them in certain places. So this doesn't, you know, this doesn't make any sense, right? I can't reassign my parameter to a different type, okay? The parameter can't change in the body of the uh, function. It's not something that I can sign to or from. Okay. Now, what happens, how are these used by the compiler? So essentially, when the compiler compiles the code, it, it, it essentially, you can think of it as replacing the type parameter with whatever parameter the user provided when they instantiated the instance of your code. So here's my class list that accepts a type parameter. That's equivalent to if I had written this class to return strings from get and to accept a string argument to set. And so this is, you know, again, think about it. You write this one class, this is all you write, and then magically, Java can transform it into a class that takes strings, a class that takes ints, a class that takes dogs or old dogs or whatever. So now essentially the compiler knows how to transform your class into a class that takes any, or any type, right? And that uses that type appropriately throughout the body of the class. So this is pretty cool, right? That this is the power of Java's generic system, right? You write this one class, you make it generic, now I get the type safety, but it's as if I had written one version of this that took strings and another version that took integers and essentially a, a separate version for every type in Java, right? Which you do not want to do, okay? You don't even know what other types are out there. Now, it's important to understand that this is actually not what happens. And, to, and, and so what, what happens actually is rather than, so, so, so here's what the compiler does. The compiler uses the type information that you provided to check to make sure that things are being done correctly, right? So essentially, if I parameterize this list with an integer, then when I call list.set, the second parameter has to be an integer or something that I can upcast automatically to an integer, something that descends from integers, okay? The compiler checks this, but then when the code is actually generated, what it does is it doesn't generate this. Instead, it just throws the weight type information away entirely, and it's as if you had written this and it returned object. Okay? So that's actually what happens behind the scenes, right? Um, and this has some implications for runtime, uh, what happens to runtime, right? That we're not gonna go into, right? But essentially, this is known as type erasure. So those types are used to check the operations so the compiler can make their, remember, this is something that we did to help the compiler. We already knew how to create a generic class, just have it accept instances of objects. Right, but we did this, we added this type information to our declarations and this, these type parameters to our classes to help the compiler help us. It knows more about what we're trying to do, and therefore it can do more to check to make things sure that we're doing things properly, okay? But again, thinking about this way isn't a bad mental model, and it's actually also more similar to how this type of thing works in some other languages, right? Okay. So I can have classes that accept multiple type parameters. We looked at this last time. Um, there's some naming conventions for type parameters that we use to kind of, um, you know, again, these are just conventions, but I would strongly suggest that you follow them. But if you see, you know, again, in that map, uh, Java doc, we saw K and V. If you see something like that, I'd be like, oh, these are type parameters, right? K is for key, right? V is for value, okay? This is just a convention. It's not enforced by the compiler. But if you follow it, it makes your code easier to read and understand, right? And there are also conventions about which type parameters get used for which kind of thing, right? So we talked about this last time. If I have something that stores a bunch of elements, I use E. If I have something that stores keys and values, I use key and B. There are certain uh, parameterized classes that require a number. Um, we'll talk about how to ensure that in a minute. Okay, so, you know, again, and I can think about maps the same way. They just take two type parameters. So everywhere I see K, I replace that with integer. Ever I see V, I replace that with string. Okay, and, and so we did this example last time. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through it again, so we save some time for the end. All right, questions about this? I will go through the example of sort of generifying the, the list if you guys want, but we did that last time. Any questions about this? Because now we're gonna bring, we're gonna make it a little more interesting. We're gonna bring in a new, um, 
a new feature of Java's generic system into the picture. All right. So let's, uh, let's look at this example of a generic class. Okay, so this is a class called Max. All right? Now look, I know this isn't a very exciting class, but it's, yeah, a little joke. Um, I think the class is very exciting. This Max class, on the other hand, you might think of it as a little boring, right? But what does it do? Um, it takes a, when I create it, I give it a bunch of values, and it computes the maximum of those values. Now here, the array is an array of integers, okay, capital I integers, and so when I work with them down here, I can use this syntax, right? This is how I compare two numbers in Java. But what if I want, and, and this works fine. Let's, let's look at it, it runs, oh, it's saying there's check style problems, right? Well, let's, let's fix those. Okay, good. But what if I want to make this generic so that it can compute the maximum of any thing, anything, okay? So right now, this class can only compute the maximum of a set of, or an array of integers. But what about if I wanted to use it on floats and on doubles and on anything where there's a maximum, okay? So some good review. So what is it, what do, what do I need in order for something to be, well, let, let's, let's start. Let's just start the process and then we'll see where we run into problems, okay? So I'm gonna try to make this class generic. I'm gonna take an element type E, okay? Um, my internal array now is going to, instead of being an integer, it's going to be an array of references to E. My constructor now has to take an array of references to type E, okay? All right, so now, and now and down here I can use this here, right? So this is my, this is a, you know, a straightforward algorithm for finding the max. I, I initially set my max to the first element, assuming there are elements. I've already handled the case where the array is null or it's empty. So now there's at least one element in the array, so I set the maximum at first to the first element in the array, and then I go through the rest of the array, starting on line 11, and I compare those elements to the max to see if they're bigger, okay? So this is the place where I start to get a little stuck, right? What do I need here, okay? So this is not going to work. It's not going to compile, right? The type parameter is fine. The constructor works fine, but when I get to line, it, essentially, where's the problem here? Who can tell me what line is gonna now cause me a problem? Yeah. Yeah, bingo, right? So this is the critical stumbling block, right? Because I can't, now I don't know if I'm gonna have an integer. I might not even have a number. I wanna be able to run this on any class but I need to be able to compare it with another instance of the same class. Okay, what needs to be true? So now we know a little bit more about the class that we're using here. So what needs to be true of the type E? We've talked about this in the past. You guys actually built this as a, as a homework problem. What needs to be true of E for this to work? Yeah. It has to implement comparable. Yeah, okay, so, so now, this is, so now we know a little bit more about what we're trying to accomplish. So I can't run, I can't compute the maximum of any Java class, because some classes are comparable with each other. But if the class implements comparable, then I can replace this line here with compare to, and then I am gonna forget whether it's greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, so we'll just try both, see which one works, right? I don't wanna look it up right now, it's a lazy. All right, so now if I know that all the elements, and if I know that the type E implements comparable, now I can actually do something really cool. I can build a generic max class that works for any type in Java where there's a well-defined way to compare it with another instance of itself another reference to another uh, element of the same type. So you might wonder, can I do this with the generic system? And the answer is yes. And here's how we do it, okay? 
So up here, if I just put a type parameter into my class declaration, I have to be able to work with any type, any kind of Java object. And here I know that that's not possible. I need something from the type. I don't need to know exactly what type it is, but I need it to have this property, okay? And so what I needed to do is, now, you probably are wondering why didn't I write this? And that's a good question. What I really need is I need a type that implements comparable. Now, this doesn't work, I don't think. Let's try it, I think it's gonna complain. Yeah, so th th this, this isn't okay. For some reason, when I use this type of, pram of type parameter declaration, I need to use extends even if what comes there is an interface, okay? So I have this interface comparable, I need a type that implements it. To guarantee that, I use e extends comparable, okay? Oh, ah, okay. So I, there's, I, I missed something, right? There's a bug. Can anyone help me find it? When I went through and I did the pipe parameterization, yeah. Yeah, what should, what, what's broken about it? Yeah, so max now returns a reference to the type that the class was parameterizing, okay? So again, just adding type parameters to my class can work wonders. So look at that. It works, and I guessed right with, uh, with the greater than or, or less than. All right, well, let's, let's try this. Let's kind of convince ourselves that we actually did something interesting here and not, not just something trivial. So let's put a different type of class in here and make sure it still works, yeah. So now I can do doubles, I can do strings, right? So what's gonna happen, uh, string compare is implementing lexicographically, so essentially I'm gonna get the thing that's the greatest in the alphabet which here is going to be two, yeah, cool. So again, let's just, let's just pause and kind of look at what we, we did here. Um, a lot of this code is boilerplate, right? But what, I, what I'm doing here, I've, I've built something pretty cool. I've built basically a generic class that can now compute the maximum over any group of objects that can be compared to each other, all right? How did I do that? Well, first I built a generic class, but then I needed my class parameter, my type parameter, to have a property. And so I used something that's called a type parameter constraint. Now, how's that gonna work? Well, let's, let's try it. Okay, so let's, uh, I need to, I need to think of a Java object that's not comparable. Let's just use just object. Let's use, like, let's just use null references. This is not a good way to do this, but what I wanna show you here is that yeah, so now what I've, what I've generated here is a compiler error. So why? So when the compiler went to try to compile my code and it got to the main method, it said, you're trying to create max um, with, and you're passing it something that is not comparable. I should also really do this. Sorry, let's put max over here. Let's do max object, max is equal to new max, and we use our our diamond operator, right? Yeah, so, so now we get the right thing, right? So now the compiler is telling us, hey, you can't compute the maximum of a list of objects, of an array of objects, because object, it says, is not within the bounds of type variable E. We bounded type variable E to only accept parameters that were comparable, and Java objects are not comparable. Again, if I change this to be string, let's go back to example I just did, let's put some, something that's not null. Right, now it works fine. So again, you know, the, 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 I'm just, we're just, tip, we're just sticking our toe into Java's, the, what, what you can do with Java generics, right? This is actually a pretty, a pretty powerful system, and some of the power now comes from this bounded type parameter capability. So essentially, the compiler knows all about the relationships between different Java classes, and so if your generic class needs some property of the type that it's parameterized with, you can express that. So here, in order for our max class to work, we needed the type parameter to refer to a type that implemented comparable. And so we told the compiler that. We said, hey, you can create a an instance of max for any type, 
as long as that type implements comparable, as long as it's comparable, right? And you can use this for both inheritance and for interface implementation. So if you need, like, something that inherits from string or from number or whatever, you can do it this way. Um, there's also these much nastier ways that combine different things, like I need, you know, a class that implements these three interfaces, right? That's also possible. Okay. And, and, and this is, you know, uh, this is where this example, I think I, I went through this backwards. All right, so a couple more things to talk about with generics before we're done. Um, interface definitions can also use generics. So again, going back to the, what we talked about at the end of our unit on object-oriented programming, if I have an interface, um, that interface can also accept a type parameter, right? And that's really important because interfaces get used a lot as the reference type for something that's, you know, going to itself take a type parameter, right? So here, my simplest interface now is parameterized and it, it sort of describes the different functions that something that implements this has to provide in terms of that type parameter. So if I implement this class, I need to provide a method called get that returns a reference to something that's the same type as the type parameter. All right. So, you know, again, there are, you know, and this, this is one of the, um, this is one of the nastier problems with generics. This came up last time, is that I cannot create an array of references to a generic type. So this thing on line five, you might think this would work. You might want it to work. There is a really gross way to get it to work. I'll leave you to find that via Google. I'm not gonna show it to you. Um, but you can and you should use type parameters whenever you work with Java's containers. All right, any questions about generics? All right, so, any questions about the midterm? Did we, did we go over the midterm format last time? We did, yeah, you guys know about that. Um, let me, let me do announcements and talk about what's happening next week, then you guys can leave. Uh, if you don't have anything else uh, you want to talk about, I will stick around until noon to take questions about the midterm or anything that might be covered on it. Um, all right, a couple, so on Monday, Ben's gonna come by and we're gonna talk about um, MT Dash, right, which started as a project uh, for this class and is now an app that's actually on the App Store. You can pay money to use it. It's got some cool features. So, you know, he'll talk a little bit about some of the things you learn when your side project becomes like a real thing. Right? Um, and then on Wednesday, what we do is, is we're back here. I hope you guys will come. Um, I ask you guys to, we give you the second half of the hour to fill out the ISIS forms. Uh, the feedback you provide on those is incredibly important to us, so I do hope you'll be here to do that. Um, we also give some awards on that day, um, so some of you won't wanna be here for that. Okay, um, there's, there's a bit, there's a bit of confusion caused by the fact that there is a final exam. I think somehow if you go through Course Explorer or something, it's not on the official class calendar on Google, but there is no exam for this class. Just wanna make that very clear. Uh, do not show up like wherever it's scheduled. Is it here or whatever on the, it's really late. It's like the 20th or something. Like don't come, I'm not gonna be here uh, and nobody else will be either, okay? Um, the last thing we do together as a class is the final project fair next Thursday. That's it, then you're done. Um, our last midterm starts on Monday in the CBTF. So this is no different than what you guys have been doing all semester, you know what to do. Um, I wish you the best of luck on it, and again, I'll stick around for a few minutes to answer questions about that. The, in lab next week, your projects are going to be evaluated. So we're gonna show the videos, and then uh, your lab, uh, the people in your lab will vote on which are their favorite projects and those ones will get some special placement in the project fair and also be put up at the top of the website that we create to highlight the projects you guys do. Um, so I'm super psyched about the fair. I've already seen there seem to be some very cool projects underway, so I'm excited about that. Um, that's what we'll do on Thursday, and then again, we're done. You guys go off, do whatever you do next. Okay, like I said, I will stick around to talk about the midterm if people have any questions. Otherwise, you guys are done a little bit early. It's the extra 20 minutes to do whatever you want, and I will see you all on Monday with Ben. <laughs>